Welcome to the third segment of Opera Insight 2024, a season where we are seeking out the ingredients of the recipe of love. What a fabulous ingredient we can find in the third opera of the 2024 season, The Righteous. I'm your presenter, Dr. Don Feinberg, and as in the past seasons, it's truly a joy to present a world premiere with music composed by Gregory Spears and a libretto by the Pulitzer Prize winning Tracy K. Smith. At the outset, let me say that this opera offers us a different view of what makes love powerful, a love rooted in spiritual connection. Psychologically, this spiritual connection sometimes is considered a part of the third level of psychological development. It's built on two previous levels. First, an historic level based on childhood or previous experience. And second, an adaptive level, learning as adults how to succeed in the world. It doesn't matter whether you're an analyst or a cognitive behaviorist, your ideas must somehow explain how a person traverses these three levels. You see, different schools of psychology have different theories about how we develop, but all must consider our history, how we function in the world, and how we relate to something larger than ourselves, the historical, the adaptive, and the spiritual levels. In a little bit, we'll return to these levels in relation to the righteous. But for now, let's take a look at the central themes of the opera. As Tracy K. Smith has described it, the opera explores the relationship between faith and power. We see this theme played out with eager and hopeful characters as they gain access to the power. And yet, they long to connect to something larger than themselves in institutions like the church, or the government, or the divine, or the majesty of the natural world. These aspects of life that are larger than the individual invite us into the realm of spiritual development. And in an opera where spiritual power of nature plays a role, what better opera venue can there be than Santa Fe's Opera House? It draws us into the performance as surely as a Santa Fe sunset inspires our awe. This connection to nature punctuates the opera and reminds us that nature is one of those sources of spiritual inspiration. The opera opens with an outdoor hunting party. We meet Paul, the governor, asking David, a preacher, to offer a prayer. David is there because he's the governor's son, Jonathan's best friend. Clearly, David is more interested in the beauty of the day than shooting the game, and his best friend Jonathan teases him, let me guess, the only thing you feel like killing out here is time. Let's see, best friends, David and Jonathan, does it ring a bell? Maybe a Sunday school lesson? King David, best friend Jonathan, who's the son of the king? So, this threesome parallels the Bible, but as composer Greg Spears explained to me, this is not a biblical adaptation. The biblical story provides scaffolding, maybe for certain plot points, character names, relationships, but rather than archetypal biblical heroes, the righteous explores the impact on ordinary lives. There is an important difference between this adaptation and an opera based on well-known myth or popular novel. A few years back, we had a world premiere of an opera called Cold Mountain, based on the best-selling novel of the same name. The opera brought the book's characters and plot to life. The music and spectacle really added emotional power to the novel. Now, this season, The Righteous brings another world premiere to the opera house, but this is not retelling the Bible story. Instead, it's a relational lattice, relating an original tale of people to whom we can relate. It explores their spiritual longing. Gregory Spears, the opera's composer, said that putting music to Tracy K. Smith's libretto combines to create an experience that transcends either. It's like adding two plus two, but it doesn't merely equal four. It rises to seven or maybe 12. In fact, Spears and Smith offers each of us an opportunity to experience for ourselves through the opera's characters and narrative, the very human longing for spiritual connection. 
It does this through the poetry of its libretto and the power of its music. Now, this opera is not preachy, which is kind of ironic if you think about it because it focuses on a preacher, David, who becomes a famous televangelist and ultimately enters politics. There is also an attraction to power, a love for power, if you will. But this love contrasts with the spiritual love deeply rooted in his faith. This latter love is the spiritual aspect of love that informs a deep and abiding love between people. David's conflict between these two kinds of love, the love of power and the love of the spirit, is central to the opera. This conflict then is heightened when as governor, David encounters Jacob, a young pastor from a struggling city community. Psychologically, David represents what we call a shadow figure, a part of you that you repress and put away from your conscious identity. Usually, we think of shadow figures as something negative, undesirable parts of ourselves, such as being greedy or mean-spirited. However, it can also be good parts of ourselves that we repress because we do not want to face our inability to embrace and live up to them. We call this the positive shadow. For David, Jacob is just such a positive shadow. Sheila, David's second wife, recognizes this fact and tells him that having Jacob's principles and ideals is precisely who David used to be. Will David re-embrace his higher spiritual calling as a part of his political life? Or will his political career swallow his ideals and his deeper love for Sheila along with him? And this is one of the reasons I love new modern opera. Unlike La Traviata, where you know from the start Violetta will lose her battle with consumption, or in the Elixir of Love, where despite all the obstacles you know Nemorino and Amina will end up together, in The Righteous, the outcomes for each of the characters are neither obvious nor inevitable. Spiritual love is a journey, and in The Righteous, we are taking that journey with the characters. Now, as introduced earlier, there are three levels of this development. And how love connects you to each other reflects this, these three levels. Level one is the historical level. It comes from personal experience, usually your upbringing. Level two is the adaptive level, the level that focuses on how we function in the world in which close, intimate relationships play a part. And when this level works correctly, it promotes a healthy balance between our longing for intimacy and our striving for autonomy. And finally, level three is the level of the psycho-spiritual. In a psychological context, it embraces our capacity to relate to the world beyond our individual self, whether it is in nature, a social movement, or God. Let's take a look at these levels in relation to the opera. Level one is love that is historically based. Like the common notion that girls may marry men like their fathers and boys like their mothers. Or, more specifically, in their primary relationship, they echo the climate of the parental and familial environment. In The Righteous, David's marriage to Michelle, his first marriage, fits this ideal of level one love. Remember, Michelle is Paul's daughter. He's an ambitious politician and governor. Michelle sees in David the preacher, a man who shares some of the ambitious characteristics of her father. As the opera unfolds, he becomes the head of a megachurch, a successful televangelist. And when the opportunity arises, he too enters politics and becomes a governor. The second level of love is the adaptive level. It reflects how we function in the world. We adapt to it in the world of work, in the world of love. In the first scene of Act One, a colleague of Paul the governor, called by his initial CM, describes Jonathan, Paul's son, as, quote, taking to the business, and comments later, you don't have to love the business, you just have to be good at it. And the adaptive level also functions in the world of love. David has found himself drawn to Jonathan's sister, Michelle, and he wants to marry her. In the next scene, his dramatic proposal is accepted by Michelle. And on the adaptive level, this is how it makes sense for them to get on with their lives. Of course, it is an opera, 
the situation is much more complicated. Jonathan also has powerful feelings for David. He creates another arc of love in the opera. And like in La Traviata, this opera contains a theme of problematic love. In giving a blessing to his best friend's love for his sister, Jonathan is making a sacrifice. The power of opera in general, and certainly in the righteous, comes not just from its ideas, but rather from how it moves us emotionally. And in this regard, the music of Gregory Spears is superb. I mentioned before how moving the set pieces and the arias were as they embrace the deeper sense of devotion and love. Also, pay attention to the way the chorus not only reinforces the themes, but also sets the emotional tone in scene after scene. The chorus draws us into the action between and within the main characters. As the story of the righteous unfolds, we encounter a sermon given by David. We get into the rhythm and power of the opera. His presentation to us in the audience draws us into the opera. It's almost as if Santa Fe's Crosby Theater feels like the megachurch itself. Now we watch as David has fallen out of love with Michelle and into love with Sheila. As David becomes more practical and political, Sheila has become more aware of the issues of their time and what needs to be done about them. Sheila finds her deeper love in her relationship to God. She sings a powerful aria. When I'm empty, she sings, it's the quiet voice of God that fills me. It's the light caught in a falling raindrop that suddenly houses a piece of eternity. As sung in the opera, it is so moving. We experience David's ambition, first in building his career as a popular televangelist, then with the opportunity of a special election to become the governor. We sense the impact it has on his relationship, as well as his relationship to his faith. How will he reconcile the principles of his faith with the pragmatic demands of the secular political world? As Helen Keller once said, many persons have a wrong idea of what constitutes real happiness. It is not obtained through self-gratification, but through fidelity to a worthy purpose. So, we in the audience get to decide where these characters are headed and which among them will end up truly happy. Finally, in conclusion, there's another aspect of this opera that really captured my imagination. How it plays with time. You see, this opera is set in the latter half of the 20th century, and yet, because of how it's presented, it really speaks to us today. As Tracy K. Smith offers near the conclusion of her 2023 book, To Free the Captives, a plea for the American soul. Where is the past? Behind us or up ahead? It is here beside us and within us. It is with us to everywhere we cast our attention. This opera is an impressive world premiere. It offers us a deep dive into love on many levels. And as we experience it into so many parts of ourselves as well. So next time, in segment four, we cast our attention to the seemingly lighthearted world of love in Strauss's operatic rom-com, Dear Rosencavalier. Underneath the comedy lurk some pretty serious lessons about love and life. See you then. <laughs>